So today we're going to do a, we're going to do a short lecture on case construction, which is basically how to make arguments and set up the arguments that you're going to present, and then you guys are going to do a debate with Injun and me. So firstly, for the past few weeks we've been talking about like what kind of roles does each speaker have to fulfill, what kind of things do, do, do each team <coughs> have to do. So we're going to go into a bit more depth and then like try to uh, put a bit more organization and structure into the things that we have been doing for the past few weeks. So last time we, we just basically talked about topics which in a more formal word is called a motion and how to interpret those motions and how we can use them to our advantage. So basically, today case constructions that we're going to cover, case is something that is basically like everything that your side is going to say. So on proposition, if you have like, if you identify a problem, and if you have three arguments, that entirety is just called a case. So basically a case is everything that your side is going to basically present throughout the debate. And case construction, therefore, is trying to set up and the layout of all the things that you're going to talk about throughout this round. Uh, so firstly, let's, so firstly, I think that a case can always be divided into the arguments and the setup. The setup is when you try to just lay the foundations and lay the ground so that it's easier for you to introduce your actual arguments. So this is like identifying the problem, saying why there's a problem in our society, talking about what you want to achieve, what's your end goal, and after you introduce every one of this, if you go into the arguments after that, this flow is going to be much more smooth, right? So setup is where you try to introduce your team's case line, what your team basically wants to achieve, the direction of your team's arguments, and so on and so forth. So we're going to talk about the proposition's case and opposition's case. Because what both sides are trying to ultimately achieve is different, proposition is trying to achieve why the proposed topic is good, while opposition is trying to prove why that's bad. So because both sides are trying to achieve different things, the cases are also going to be a little bit different. Although the arguments are going to be basically the same. So let's first go into proposition first. And then the notes for this is also in our, our shared Google Drive. So I'm going to send the PDF file of this thing to you guys after this session. So you guys can read about that at home. But first on proposition. The setup, I think, is mainly three things that you have to do, or it's very good to do on proposition. The topic, so we have a proposed topic, which is a course of action. And this sounds really complicated, but basically, if you think about every topic, let's take an example. So like, can you give me like any topic, any debate topic? Um, should Should Zeus be bad? Okay. In that topic, basically, the course of action that should Zeus be bad, this topic is proposing, is banning Zeus, right? So every topic, in essence, advocates for some kind of change. And in this case, that change was banning Zeus. But one thing to recognize here is that if you're going to take a certain action, there needs to be a problem, right? Because if there's no problem, there's no point of changing something. <coughs> If there's no problem, there's nothing to change. When you're talking about banning Zeus, there must be a problem with Zeus that you have to ban Zeus. So the first thing to do in proposition is to identify the problem that exists in our society. And we call that in fancy words, the status quo. Status quo, which is basically another word for our society. And this is the, kind of similar to the problem in our society. And here's where you like, kind of talk about the talk about what is so problematic and why this topic is so important, especially in the 21st century context. So, for example, uh, I can't think of a suitable example, but you could, relate the, you could relate the proposed topic with certain things that are going on in our world, some things like, uh, some things like global warming, some things like climate change etc. And then that's where you propose 
talk about the problem and why this topic is so significant to your side. So this is the first part of the setup. And the second part, which is definitions, is where you just define all the words in the motion. Ah, define some of the important words in the motion. There's really no need to define every single one of them. So when you're talking about should we ban zoos or not, this house will ban zoos, then each side has to agree upon what they're talking about to do a debate, right? So you would first want to define some central terms in the, in the topic, this house will ban zoos. So a central term would be, for instance, ban and zoos, right? Because these two are probably the most important things on how this debate is going to happen and unfold. And in definitions, what's really important in proposition is that you do not use an unfair definition. <clears throat> you, know, you can, like, a proposition side could define the act of ban as only banning public zoos. But then that's very unfair for opposition, right? Because if proposition comes up with something that's, with a definition that's really like abnormal, not something that's very weird, <coughs> It's very hard for opposition to actually tackle that because opposition was expecting that proposition was coming up with a fair definition. So you need to use definitions that are fair because if you're using unfair definitions, it's like just virtually impossible for the debate to happen. And the final one here is now you identify what this topic is about. So this is what, and the problem is basically why. Why you want to do this? and this one is what you want to do. Then, after you laid these two foundations, now it's time for you to talk about how you're going to do it. So, if you're talking about banning zoos, what's going to be, like, how are you actually going to ban zoos? Is it going to be just banned overnight? Or are you going to give, like, several years for these zoos to release their animals into the wild or so on? or there might be some problems with like, endangered animals. What are you going to do with those? So opposition might ask those questions to you, so you can actually prevent those questions by having a more really specific and well-developed solution in this part. And then after you said this, you would go on to the arguments. But before we go on to the arguments, are there any questions? Is everything clear? Okay, then, before we go on to the proposition argument, we will go to opposition setup and talk about how opposition could respond to these three things. So the reason why there's this giant question mark here is because unlike proposition, there's really a lot of flexibility in opposition case. You can do many, you can twist many things from side proposition's case. First thing that you could do is basically say that there's no problem in the very first place. So you see a lot of things like politicians coming up and saying that climate change is not happening. That's an example of this strategy. Just saying that the problem doesn't exist, and then if the problem doesn't exist, then that would automatically mean that the solution is also not really important. Because if there's no problem, there's no need to have a solution. Like You can't have a solution if you don't have a problem. So hence the first strategy would be to say that the problem does not exist. Or the second strategy I also found would probably be that just agree that the problem does exist, but proposition solution is actually making it worse, or it's just changing nothing. So in the in the motion, this has to ban this has to ban homework. If the problem that side proposition identifies is the stress of students, on opposition you could just say that okay, we agree that stress of students is like super important, but getting rid of homework doesn't really change anything. And then some reasons that you might give is that if you get rid of homework, like your grades are going to be dependent more on the tests or like standard tests or other things, and therefore students are going to be more stressed because the tests become much more important. And then you could talk about how you, how you could propose another solution, which is instead of banning homework, you would ban tests or something like that. So basically, you can use any one that's more comfortable for you, and then it's really up to you to decide which kind of strategy that you're going to take. And I think that this is where the strategy inside debating really becomes super important, because based on what kind of case study that you follow, it could be much easier for you to win or much harder for you to win at the end. Uh, 
So before going to arguments, are there also questions about opposition sign set? No? Everything clear? Okay. So this is the setup part. So this is like laying the foundations of both sides. And then don't try to memorize this because like if you really try to understand it, it becomes much more intuitive, kind of. And then so let's go with the arguments. The reason why I divided arguments into two is because I think the arguments can be divided into something called principal arguments and practical arguments. A principal argument is when you're talking about things like freedom or rights or like can someone give me any other example can someone, can someone give me an example of a freedom okay like freedom of speech the right to say whatever you want to do rights like one of the rights might be I don't know like, anyways like these are what basically principal arguments are about that something is a uh, something is harming the freedom of speech, and therefore we have to get rid of that. That is some of the principal arguments. While on the other hand, practical arguments are more of things. These are things related to like money, or uh, like social message, and these are like morals, ethics. And you can see, and you can immediately see that principal arguments are more than like fluffy things, the things that you can't really touch. While practical arguments are, <coughs> as the name tells you, like practical things, like actual things in real life, things like money or development of a country, like maybe security as well. These are basically what goes into a practical arguments category. Then why is it like really important to have both? Why can't we have only one and then just bash the entire case? The reason why it's really good to have both is that a really important thing of principal arguments is that they cannot be destroyed by practical arguments. This sounds really hard, right? So I'll give you an example. Let's talk about the right to life. So right to live, which is basically, yeah, the right to like not get shot or like not so basically, let's talk about the right to live. On the practical argument, let's say that killing one person uh, <coughs> let's say that there's a hypothetical scenario where if you kill one person, you're going to get like a million dollars. But even if the practical argument in some sense can argue that getting a million dollars is beneficial for you, this can never be a direct rebuttal to the right to live. Because always moral arguments and these, mo and these things related to morality always become important and trump all of these practical considerations. So at the end, the getaway of this is that, the takeaway of all of this is that principal arguments cannot be refuted with practical arguments. So if you have a side that entirely destroys your practical arguments, if they don't touch upon your principal arguments, you can tell the audience and the judge that, look, our principal arguments still stands because all of their responses, all of their rebuttals were just based upon <coughs> practical arguments. And then this is like also a strategy that, strategy that you could use by saying that until the end of the debate, your principal arguments stood because they didn't tackle ours and only tackle the practical arguments. That's why it's good to have two these uh, two parallel ways of constructing arguments inside your case. A really generic but really effective way of constructing a case would be first argument principle and second, third argument as practical arguments. Uh, Inji, can you give me a motion? Motion? Yeah, an easy one. Easy one. This sounds to legalize legal intrusion. This has to legalize organ trading. This has to legalize organ trading, okay. Okay, let's say that the topic is this has to legalize organ trading, which is just basically allowing people to sell their organs to other people. The principal argument in this case might be just the freedom to do whatever 
thing you want to do with your body. This would be the principal argument in this case, while practical arguments could be how the individual could earn money by doing this, and then how that money could be used for things that the individual wants to do, like send their kids to college if you're a, like a, if you're a poor family that can't really afford expensive college tuitions. These could be some practical arguments. So you could run these two parallel types of arguments and then have a case that's really, really strong. And then, yeah. But practical, but in terms of practical arguments, it could be quite hard to think two arguments. So a common technique that lots of debaters use is something called stakeholder analysis. A stakeholder, a stakeholder is a hard word for anyone that's related to a topic. So if we're talking about the topic, this also legalizes organ trading, a stakeholder would be, uh, can that table, okay, I'll go first. Some of these stakeholders could be the government, because the government is legalizing organ trading. Can you also give me an example of a stakeholder in this motion? That table over there. So a stakeholder is just anyone related to the motion. So any type of, any group of people that's related to a topic. So here I put governments because if the government is legalizing this, the government is also going to make laws related to this. So the government is one of the stakeholders. Doctors? Yeah, doctors. Right. Doctors and also the most important stakeholder obviously would be the person who's selling the organ, right? Organ seller. The other stakeholder could also be the people who's buying the organ, which is the organ buyer, right? And we, you can think of all of these stakeholders and this is very effective because you can go each one by one and think in the perspective of these people. How is this motion going to affect doctors? How is this motion going to affect organ sellers? How is this motion going to affect organ buyers? And then if you think about each of these stakeholders, it's very easy to come up with arguments for each of these stakeholders about how this motion affects each of these people. In some cases, the motion might affect some people positively, in some cases it might negatively. But you can choose the types of stakeholders that can be used for one of your arguments, and then that will be a very, uh, very effective and fast way to construct these practical arguments. So, um, I think that's it. Are there any questions?